Um, but so um, what's happening uh, is that today's lecture and uh, Paul Yushkovich will be uh, finishing the material he planned um, and um, there will be no time for questions both during and at the end of his presentation. And if there's more time, then I will pick up with uh, with me lecturing. Let me remind ev everybody that we're back in the classroom next for the next lecture on Thursday. Uh, I'll, and so I'll be lecturing in, in the normal fashion from there. Uh, writing on the whiteboard, and um, and then uh, on a week from today, uh, in the classroom, Tom Fletcher will be uh, will be giving a lecture on statistics on Romanian manifolds. Um, let me point out that Tom will be at the department for the whole day. Uh, and uh, if anybody would find it particularly beneficial to meet with him during that day, during that day, uh, you should get in touch with me, and I'll see if he's willing to do that, and we can arrange it. Okay, so with that, Paul, why don't you continue your lecture? Thank you again for doing it. Well, thank you again for having me, and thank you all for coming back for. <laughs> for uh, day two. Um, so um, let me just get the right screen. Right. So uh, I'll, I'll just very quickly uh, remind you where we where, where we talked about last class and where we left things off and then we'll pick up. So um, we have already looked uh, briefly at the Blom geometry um, and how it applies uh, in the context of deformable medial models. And then we went through this um, inverse skeletonization approach where we <clears throat> form models by solving a solving it by harmonic uh, partial differential equation. And where we're heading next is, is the other approach that I was going to talk about, a more recent approach where we start with a boundary as the main uh, object that's represented. And then we um, impose constraints that make sure that that boundary has a medial axis of a known uh, structure. And the other thing we haven't really talked much about yet is um, in terms of applications uh, in biomedical imaging. So those are the two things left for today. And I will just quickly skip through the slides to get to where we were. Um, again, just uh, pause maybe one slide here. Yeah, so th this slide here really summarizes the main point of what we talked about last class, and that is um, that <clears throat> our objective was to have a deformable model that consisted of a medial surface and a radius function. So the medial surface are the centers of spheres and R is uh, the radii of those spheres. And then <clears throat> we show that you can easily derive from the X and R a formula for the corresponding points on Y, which is the um, envelope of the family of these spheres, or in other words, a boundary surface. But the challenge was that if you try to model this using splines or some other uh, parametric approach, um, almost certainly the X and R that you will uh, generate parametrically are going to result in a surface Y that consists of disjoint pieces and might have folds and other, uh, other problems as well. And so particularly focusing on getting rid, rid of disjoint pieces, we talked about that there are a set of equality constraints that have to hold um, along the edges of this surface, um, as well as if it's a branching surface, they, those constraints would have to hold along the branches. 
And um, the PDE-based approach uh, found a way in which we can satisfy these equality constraints by formulating R as a solution of a partial differential equation with um, inputs rho, which is another function that's defined on this medial surface, and R0, which is a value of R just along the edge itself. And that allowed us to handle the equality constraints. Inequality constraints could be handled through various um, additional penalties that can be added to the solution. And so that kind of, this was a de demonstration of this approach in practice where we're fitting a hippocampus shape and you can see the parameter rho on the left and the corresponding solution the partial differential equation that gives you the r function that now satisfies the in the quality constraints and the model fitting to the target object So I, I did talk a little bit about um, applications uh, of these models for normalization. So for um, basically a, a different approach for registration of white matter structures uh, was shown here. And I believe the last thing I talked about was another um, very practical approach to medial modeling, where instead of solving the PDE, which does have some downsides particularly it's just computationally expensive um as you're optimizing a deformable model to be always uh, solving this differential equation at every iteration so another way if we kind of care less about the mathematical correctness um and just want to model for practical purposes we can also kind of uh hack our way around the inequality the, the equality constraints along the edges by almost pretending that <laughs> they're not being violated or in other words we penalize the thing that we want to drive to zero and when we don't drive to zero we just do some geometrical editing of the model to um, make it be closed and, and in practice it works okay but it's not not my favorite approach but we have used it sometimes um so um, just uh, going over applications a little bit more, um, one of the early applications, uh, and this was done actually using this uh, kind of a hacky model rather than a PDE-based model, uh, was for myocardium segmentation. So um, here we wanted to simultaneously segment uh, the left and right um, myocardium or the myocardium of the left and right ventricles um, from uh, CineMR. And this was a work by Hui Sun, who was uh, my first PhD student. I uh, graduated in 2008 and, um, or maybe 2009. And um, here, um, a lot of the focus of her work was on um, actually the terms uh, to compute similarity between the boundary uh, of a deforming model and uh, image data. This is, of course, before the days of deep learning and UNETs uh, and uh, graph CNNs. This was much more uh, old school. But um, the role of the media representation here was to provide a, a shape prior for the segmentation. And uh, it, worked, it worked well in, in as the segmentation quality with a shape prior was better than without having a shape prior and then um we could fit these uh templates to a collection of uh different uh, cardiac images and look at average myocardial shape average thickness as well as uh looking at the cardiac cycle we could compute uh, measures of thickening from end diastole to end systole so Paul, what are we seeing here I mean, it looks like two objects, uh, one, one sort of roughly spherical and another one. Yeah, so uh, you're seeing, uh, so the myocardium is, is kind of, uh, I don't know, it's almost like two teacups joined together along an edge, I guess. So you're looking into the, into the um, ventricle and 
So this the, the circular one that's the left ventricle, it has thicker uh, muscle around it and the more uh, elongated that's the right ventricle and it has a thinner um actually you know what i have a, another model that i was going to show at the end loaded here so this is similar same anatomy so you can see so you've got like three surfaces there at least maybe four three uh, surfaces yeah uh and okay so it's not clear uh what the what the medial model is a medial model i mean where where, where is the skeleton so the skeleton okay so the skeleton here um let's zoom in is the the color surface on the left and you can see that the the triangles are coming together along a seam over here let me turn on my head. And on, on the right, what you see is um, the boundary corresponding to that skeleton. So the boundary surface corresponding to that skeleton. The So there's a single skeleton for, for both, uh, for bo both the heart chambers? Yes, yeah, so it's a single skeleton model. It's fitted at the same time, and uh, it consists of <clears throat> um, basically there's one seam curve and three surfaces, right? So there's the there's the left ventricle surface, there's the right ventricle surface, and then there's the surface that's shared between the two ventricles. Okay, but I, I it feels to me like I'm seeing uh, a a full skeleton it's this yellow thing for for the left chamber and another and another one for the right chamber is that right um i mean uh, they're they are they are together right they're part of the same um skeleton it's it's a it's a skeleton with with branches okay so it has branches yeah uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, so that was the part that wasn't yet clear because you, oh, okay. hadn't, you hadn't yet been talking about yeah. that. Yeah. No, I kind of jumped ahead. I'm I'm sorry. So the so actually, yeah, let me I I I I definitely will talk about the branches. So this was this was the first time um in, in Fuison's work that we uh did branches uh in, in a skeletal model. But as I said, in order to deal with the constraints that are invol involved uh odd branches we we just had to kind of um you know as i said sort of hack them by uh introducing treating them as inequality constraints um and then kind of fixing up uh the geometry around there uh what i'll talk about later is actually a more um more mathematically i'd say a clean way of handling branching models. All right, it's just some more statistical maps um, from, from this thesis. Um, just for a little bit more staying on um, on applications and cardiac applications, because it's really been a major uh, area in where, where we have applied medial models. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, this work has really been um, spearheaded by Allison Pouch uh, and uh, now by uh, her, her students and trainees and uh, clinical collaborators. And uh, Allison started using deformable models for uh, mitral valve and then aortic valve modeling. And so um, these valves are, um, if I go back, well, you can kind of see here. Um, but I can also go back to the geometry I was showing here. So the valves sit up here um, and they control the flow of, of blood um, <coughs> between um, between the, the ventricles and the atrium and, and then the aorta. Um, so 
and, and these these valves, you know, they're they're difficult. To, they're they're thin. Um, they also uh, are hard to image. So typically, they're imaged with uh, 3D ultrasound. Um, they move very quickly, and so th there's a, just a lot of practical challenges in um, trying to segment them because, of course, ultrasound is just a diff difficult modality for segmentation to begin with. And then, um, you know, trying to Im impose correct geometry because, you know, if you just get a binary segmentation, uh, it, you know, it's just a set of scattered pixels and, and to really do anything meaningful with these um, segmentations, um, any kind of uh, shape analysis, we need a, a model that captures the correct geometry. So in this case, um, in Allison's uh, original work, um, there are two leaflets to, uh, to this uh, mitral valve. Uh, they're shown here in, in blue and, uh, and red. They're called the anterior and posterior leaflets. And each one of them uh, would be modeled by a separate model. So no branching uh, here. It was just two single sheet models for the anterior and posterior leaflets. And in um, each independently, fit with an s -herb. each independently fitted that's correct that's correct they're they're each fitted independently uh to a corresponding binary image and um at least in, in the beginning there were no between models con constraints so we haven't really um focused uh at all in our work on space between models um like like, like you have done with the s -rep. uh and it's static as well right it will become dynamic, so I, I will show you um, in a slide or two some dynamic models. Cool. So just some of the work that um, so some of the reasons and applications of it for this. Um, one is uh, very basic, but it's preoperative visualization. So um, you know, so Allison works very closely with surgeons uh, who do these uh, mitral valve re uh, repair surgeries um, or complete replacement surgeries and visualization is critical because um, when surgeons are working um, you know the heart is not is not pumping blood um, because the patient is uh, anesthetized and um, and so you you don't see the leaflet in its true configuration and um, Again, just looking at four, at a four D ultrasound volume rendering doesn't capture the geometry of the of the leaflets. It, it's it's very grainy, and so you know, just something as simple as visualizing the leaflet and and allowing the surgeon to see what it what it looked like when the when the heart was pumping blood is important for them to make surgical decisions. Um, another application, um, and this is a cool application of shape analysis, is um, for the design of um, annuoplasty rings. So these are rings that are used during valve repair. Um, the surgeons uh, we're working with were interested in building a ring that's not just, you know, not just a, a, some circle or torus, um, but actually represents the typical shape of the valve. And so by fitting models to, to a population and then computing average, shape um and and then extracting some information from that shape uh we're able to develop uh this this annuoplasty ring that is more um specific to not not to an individual patient but to a to the patient population overall um of course um for diagnostic applications uh or for any kind of outcome prediction um, we can uh, quantify various features from fitted models and so you know these plots show some um, features i do not remember i know what sld stands for bending angle has to do with um, an angle i think between uh, the valves I mean, between the leaflets, but again, just showing that, you know, these are features that can be clinically useful for differentiating um, normal versus um, ischemic valve disease valves. And overall, the vision of the surgical team uh, driving this research is to have 
and inside of an OR system where um, at you know a few minutes before surgery, um, we, we can do some predictive modeling uh, on how successfully uh, <clears throat> a patient would respond to a particular surgical strategy because surgeons have multiple strategies they can select from and using features derived from the valve geometry to, to make that inference. Um, so are there some other applications? I've been to 3D printing. Um, we've also extended um, some of this valve modeling work to pediatrics with a group at uh, Children's Hospital of uh, Philadelphia. And some other applications have been more um, with in applications to fluid dynamics. Um, so, you know, modeling the flow of blood with the help of valve models, as well as some biomechanics uh, applications um, where once the medial models have been fitted, uh, the geometry is then used as input to uh, finite element modeling uh, to, to compute things like uh, strain. We've also done some modeling of the placenta uh, for another project. It's just kind of showing you some, some practical applications where these medial representations have come in useful. So I'll come back now to, to the methods um, because sort of the, 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 the stuff I showed you before was either based on this PDE approach or on the brute force uh, approach when we you know, found the PDE to be too computationally expensive, or uh, there's another practical consideration, which is that in order to solve PDEs, you have to use a um, sparse solver. And unfortunately, um, you know, with all the open source stuff happening, that's one area where a lot of stuff is still closed source. And so when you're working with PDEs, you have to um, with large sparse systems, you have to find solvers and, you know, the, the, be the better ones are still free for academic use, but you have to jump through a lot of hoops to download, to get a license and stuff like that. And so <laughs> it, it makes it more difficult to share software, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, so still the main limitation of the PDE-based approach is that it is computationally expensive. It requires solving a large um, sparse linear system every iteration. And then there's this global dependency um, of the solution R on the inputs, right? So that that's kind of, you, you know, you can change rho at one place in the model. And somewhere very far away, the value of R, the solution of the PDE, will depend on that row. And for optimization, you know, that that's kind of inefficient when you don't have local um, dependencies or when you have non-local dependencies. Um, the PDE method really has, it, it cannot be used for modeling tubular structures. It really depends on Blum inverse skeletonization, which itself depends on having uh, a skeleton that's almost everywhere by tangent um, spheres. And it's quite limited in terms of branching configurations. So um, I have an example here of like a toy example where the PDE-based approach could be used for um, modeling a branch. So it's kind of like, um, it's a letter Y that's rotated um if you can picture that and that configuration we can solve with the pde because each branch in this configuration is just a circle but if we have like real world branches that have endpoints and uh or can self-intersect then um that's just not something that at least i've ever been able to figure out how to make work as a boundary condition for pde um, there have been other attempts at, you know, what I'd call uh, continuous medial representation um, with branches. So one was Tom Fletcher um, worked on a spline-based strategy that could handle uh, more complex configurations with, a, you know, branch end. This was back at the very early days of this in, in the early 2000s. Um, and then um, 
uh, Tim Terryberry, who worked with uh, Guido Gehrig, um, I think at NYU already. Um, if not, I, no, no, I think it was at UNC. I'm it was sorry. at UNC. It was at UNC. It was at UNC. Um, also worked on a spline-based approach to continuous modeling. Um, but the way that the, we went about dealing with branching um, was a different approach, which, which is what I'm going to present next. Okay, let me just ask early, uh, are, are you also going to talk about how you restrict the model so that it doesn't branch? That is to say, in a, in a situation where you don't want branching, that which is what you've already talked about. Mm -hmm. How does that how does that prevent branching? Yeah, so I think it's all part of the same. Um, so it's 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 branching. The branching is prescribed. It, uh, the template tells you what kind of branching is there is, and and then it doesn't change. Okay, fine. Yeah. So. Um, all right. So we call this uh, approach immediately constrained boundary model or boundary constrained media model. I think we've used both <laughs> terms, uh, but uh, here's the main idea. And that is that um, in general, the boundary is going to have simpler geometry compared to the to the medial axis. So, so you know, if we look at this special case of just a single sheet medial axis, you know, an, an ellipsoid. Even there, the geometry is kind of uh, tricky. So for example, as you approach the edge, the spokes are going to come together infinitely fast, um, which, you know, that in itself presents a, a problem for parametric modeling. Whenever uh, something that you're modeling has asymptotic behavior, uh, once you're dealing with branching, you, you know you you have to deal with these uh, <clears throat> pieces of surfaces that come together. Um, that you know, trying to parametrically model something that is a set of um, singularities uh, mathematically, you know, it, it it maybe not the best way to. <laughs> To approach um, the problem, and so the boundary, on the other hand, is is typically we can get away with modeling the boundary of an object as a you know something that's homeomorphic to a sphere, or maybe you know a sphere with some holes in it. But most of the time, it's something homeomorphic to a sphere, and also it's typically smooth, right? So most biological objects, the boundary is going to be smooth. So if you know if we would just want to model something as a triangular mesh, it's a lot easier to model the boundary um, than to model the medial axis. <clears throat> so the problem, of course, if we model the boundary just freely, um, then as we deform the boundary, then the medial axis is also going to change in its structure. Um, you'll get new branches forming, etc. So the key idea here was that we can model the boundary geometrically, but we can in incorporate constraints into our model that make sure that the medial axis branching does not change as the model deforms. So we have a boundary model, but with a set of constraints that says, this model will always have a single sheet medial axis, or this model will always have the medial axis consisting of three sheets, like that hard structure that I showed before. And this results in a set of constraints, a, a large set of constraints um, that have to be maintained during optimization. Um, a lot of them are equality constraints. And so um, in order to make this work, we have to make use of optimization techniques that are specifically set up for optimizing object objective functions with a set of constraints. Um, and actually, you know, in 2013, when I was write writing it up, I, it was very surprising, well, not maybe shouldn't have been surprising, but it's cool to find that actually a lot of these uh, ideas of uh, sort of coupled surfaces or um, boundary models with symmetry, um, 
constraints or at least symmetry seeking behavior have been around for, for a long time, as, as long as 1988 in, in uh, work by Terzopoulos. So here's the basic sketch of this boundary first approach compared to the skeleton first approach. The skeleton first approach is what we talked about in, in the last lecture. And we start with a bunch of control points, uh, a bunch of radii associated with those control points. And then we, uh, from that, expand it to get a boundary. In the boundary first approach, we start with a bunch of, with a boundary represented uh, as a spline or as a triangular spline loop subdivision surface or and then we um define what we call medial links so these are pairs of boundary points typically that are uh, across each other on the medial axis so most of the time you know a boundary point will be linked to one other boundary point which corresponds to there being a maximal inscribed uh, disk that's bitangent at those two points. But you also have a situation where you can have three points that are medially linked that corresponds to a branch point on the skeleton. And you can have points that are not medially linked to any other point. Those correspond to the endpoints of the medial axis. And if we define these medial links, then um, the medial axis can be inferred from the boundary information and from the medial link information. It's, it's really um, the, the whatever information there is in the medial axis is, is also present in the medial links themselves. So, so the key, key thing about this model is that you have a boundary representation and then you you find a set of medial links. Those links exist to begin with because that object is going to have a skeleton. So you can find those links for a given configuration, but then you, we preserve those medial links as the model is being deformed. So I'll, um, I'll go through that in a couple more slides. So this is just another figure kind of that you try to illustrate this. Again, we have a model that's represented at the boundary level um but then there are pairs of points here it would be this point uh u and this point v or x u and x v that are medially linked so there is a circle that is by tangent to them uh the original configuration of the model and then we're fitting this model to this gray shape and during the fitting we also want to make sure that these two points stay medially linked so they as they deform there still is a circle that is bitangent at those two points and another thing to note here is we have this point xw and in order for this blue circle to be a maximally inscribed disk in the model the point xw has to be outside of the disk if xw somehow was inside of the disk it would not be an inscribed disk. And this is true for not just this point XW, but for every point uh, other than XU and XV. All of these points have to stay outside of that circle. As the model deforms, this point also has to stay, has to continue being outside of this circle. So that's what it really takes to preserve medial links. It, it means that um, these two points are both uh, by tangent to a circle and they stay by tangent to a circle and all the other points do not encroach on a circle as we deform. Um, <clears throat> so just to formalize this a little bit, um, again, we say that points A and B on the boundary of an object are medially linked if they belong to the same maximal inscribed ball or maximal inscribed disk. And again, you have some examples of medially linked points, um, A and B, B and C, A and C, um, E and F, and then D is not linked to anybody. And then these are the necessary conditions for medial linkage. So two points 
are medially linked or again belong to the same uh, ball, maximum scribe ball. Uh, if there exists some value r greater than zero, so that if we look along the normal to y1 and go distance r along the normal to y1, and then we go distance r along the normal to y2, we'll meet at the same point. Right, so, so Rn1 is this vector, Rn2 is this vector, and they have to meet at the same point. So that's the constraint that makes sure that there is a circle that is tangent. There's a shared circle that's tangent at both of these boundary points. Again, for this circle to not just be a bitangent circle, but to be a maximal inscribed circle or disk, we also have this additional requirement that any point Z on the boundary of the object has to be farther away from this point where the two vectors meet than R. So the distance from Z to Y minus R and one, or this could be Y two minus R and two, because that's those, the same quantity, has to be greater than or equal to R. So it's pretty straightforward to show that if these conditions are satisfied, then the disk will in fact be maximum described. So then um, if we can just satisfy this everywhere, then we can preserve medial structure. That's really the upshot of this um, idea. So if we think of there being some initial shape S, with its medial linkage defined. And we have some deformation, some transformation, call it phi, smooth and invertible. Um, and we apply phi to S, and we're going to get some new shape S prime. Um, we will say that the, this deformation is medial link preserving. If for any two points, Y1 and Y2, on the boundary of the original object to S, um, points phi y1 and phi y2 are medially linked in the deformed object if and only if y1 and y2 are medially linked in S. In other words, phi a is, is S the boundary or is it the closure of the interior? Um, that's a Good question. So S is really S is the object itself. Um, I understand, but the question S is the boundary. Is, is the diffeomorphism applied essentially on the, on the boundary, or is it applied applied in the whole space? In the whole space. The boundary. The diffeomorphism is applied in the whole space. Like this is, you know, this is in R two. So phi is just a function in R2 that maps every point in R2 to some new point in R2 that is smooth and invertible. So, so if phi has this property that um, we applied it to S and, and let's say points phi A and phi B are medially linked, and we go back and check that indeed A and B were also medially linked, before we applied the diffeomorphism. And if this is true for all pairs of points on the boundary of S prime, then we can show that there exists a one-to-one -one and onto mapping between the medial axis of S and S prime. Basically, every maximum inscribed disk here in S prime has a corresponding maximum inscribed disk in the original shape. So from this, we can formulate kind of a, you know, a, a ideal, idealized continuous formulation of a boundary constraint or medially constrained boundary model. Um, so what we need here is some way to parametrize our, uh, the boundary of the object S. 
So we let U be some parametric domain, for example, the unit sphere, so that um, X is a mapping from U to the boundary of S, and we want it to be smooth and bijective. And so that gives us a global parameterization of, of uh, the boundary of S. And then uh, we define this uh, space L as a cross product of U with itself. In other words, it's a pair of parameter values, set of all pairs of parameter values, U, V. And so L is a subset of that set U cross U uh, so that X of U and X of V are medially linked in S. So in other words, it's, it's a set of all the pair of points uh, like these two that are me medially linked with each other. And so we, we can define that. And then we, we, we can formulate a minimization problem where we're looking over all diffeomorphisms in some space of diffeomorphisms D. And we're also looking over a set of uh, R values in this set L. In other words, for every medially linked pair, we want to assign it a, a radius value. And then we want to minimize a match between the target shape and the form shape, um, as well as some regularization on phi. So the deformed shape is obtained by applying this. I think I'm missing a formula, but you know the deformed shape S prime is just a, applying phi to S. So we want to make the deformed shape as similar as to possible to the target shape, and we also want some regularization terms on the deformation field. And here come the constraints. So for every pair UV in L, so again, for every pair of parameter values for which in the original shape, the points are medially linked, we want them to stay medially linked. That's the first, that's the equality constraint of medial linkage. And then for every pair UV in L plus any additional W, uh, which is another parameter value, we want y prime of w to be farther away from the center point than r. So, so really, all these formulas are just a way of taking the previous set of constraints and kind of expressing them for all the points um, on the surface rather than individual points. Now, this right now is a problem with uh, an infinite number of constraints because this, this holds for an infinite number of these UV pairs. So it's definitely not something that can be handled. So, you know, the first step is, is to discretize this. And um, to discretize this, um, again, we, we do some triangulation. Um, so this figure just kind of show us how we actually build templates and assign can I, can I ask a question before yeah. you talk about the discretization mm -hmm. um if i remember okay so this diffeomorphism uh is a a mapping from every point in in some in some space uh to corresponding points uh mm -hmm. into the points it maps to right mm -hmm. Uh, the first question, so I asked before, and I want to re-ask, uh, what is that space that it's applied on? Is it an infinite space? Is it a, a space that has a, uh, you know, a rectangle containing the object? Is it, is it what is it? What's I mean, it could be an infinite space. I don't think it's not, I mean, it could be an infinite space. It could be a space that is you know sufficient with a boundary far enough from the object that you know is not immediately uh on touching the object but yeah okay so the next question is okay so uh the diffeomorphisms uh are typically understood in terms of local velocities um uh 
and uh, that that have a time a time associated with them, and you can let the time run from I'll call it t equals zero to t equals one. Um, and as a result, you have deformations that um, exist not only for t for the two endpoints at zero and one, but all all the times in between. Mm -hmm. Uh, and my memory is that Jim Damon, uh, unfortunately the late Jim Damon, uh, had a concern that somewhere along along that time domain, the the satisfaction of this uh, linking uh, conditions uh, weren't necessarily going to be maintained. You, uh, so I'm yeah. Going what what is your concern answer to that concern yeah so i i i don't have a so so i think so there there are two things to see one is that I, I think the concern was more about the more recent work which was in our in 2019 where actually we were modeling this time flowing diffeomorphism here um you know the diffeomorphism is just to kind of used to set up the 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 idea so so there's no velocity here this is not talking about some diffeomorphism that is um explicitly modeled and parameterized by integrating a velocity field like you would in LDDMM we're just talking about having a smooth and and bijective map now um you know Jim's concern was uh I mean I wouldn't call it concern it was like he showed he had specific things that he showed that it, it, it it's it's not um so so if I remember correctly at the branch point for example if you had a certain angle to begin with between the um three medial branches then if you apply the diffeomorphism you could not reconfigure that angle to any arbitrary new angle so it, it doesn't mean that it had you know that angle was the angles were like 60 you know 90 and whatever is left um to make uh 360 that they would they would stay the same way but there was a some expression involving those angles that would uh be invariant as you apply the diffeomorphism whereas if you actually were trying to fit you know deform one shape to another shape in reality you would want to reconfigure that angle and so in order to allow that kind of geometry to locally break you needed to have something that is uh less constrained than a diffeomorphism because um so 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 that I think the smoothness of the diffeomorphism was was the issue, not not necessarily that it was parameterized by, by velocity. Okay, um, so let me ask the question a bit differently. Uh, mm -hmm. Forget the branching. Mm -hmm. Say say you have a an unbranching model, mm -hmm. uh, and you are looking for this diffeomorphism. Is do you have a theorem that there exists? a diffeomorphism that maintains the the uh the linking so um i mean you for example you can find examples of uh diffeomorphisms that preserve medial linking so you um you can take an, uh, two pairs of ellipsoids right and each has a medial axis and you can find a diffeomorphism that maps one to the other um you know so everything kind of is is is, is legitimate um i guess what i'm asking is if if ob you have object a which is your model and object b which is your target uh and if b has a uh, a a medial locus of the of the right topology that doesn't you know for example there's no branching in the first one and you have another one for the other then there exists a diffeomorphism 
that will get you from one to the other. So I think, so, so I think, like, you know, as Jim pointed out, there are issues with the branching. There are issues that locally, just around the branch point, you will not be able to fit it perfectly. Um, so right, but I'm talking about unbranching. I'm talking. I'm pretty sure with unbranching, it's not. It shouldn't. It's not a problem. Okay. Without branching, this was not a problem. With, with, and 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 with branches, it is. It is a problem, but it is something that is is a very local geometric property. So, once you know things are discretized, it it doesn't really you know practically um, impact things, but you know it's it's definitely you know mathematically you cannot uh map you cannot use a diffeomorphism to map of of the ambient space to map a object with its medial axis to another object with its medial axis even though the, the two medial axes have the same configuration but if you you know the there's some something related to the angle between the branches that um a diffeomorphism cannot cannot overcome um so let, let me just uh can i go on steve by all means okay all right so um just want to talk a little bit about practical stuff and discretization because i mean that's in the end how we how we work with these models so um, one thing is like, how do we find these uh, medial linkages to begin with? It's, it's, it's not necessarily trivial, right? So um, in practice, everything is, is discretized. Again, it's discretized using triangular meshes. And um, the tools we, we use, um, you know, the, the latest iterations in Slicer is to start with some template object. Um, you know some characteristic shape uh, and then put down triangles along the skeleton of that um, characteristic object so here you know we have some toy shape for which i computed a skeleton using um, voronoi based methods and then put together put some points along the branch along the free edge along the other free edge and connected them into triangles so this is completely manual um, then what we do is inflate this model. Basically, every triangle on the medial axis is transformed into a pair of triangles, one on one side of the medial axis and another one on the other side of the medial axis. And then we kind of move these triangles in the normal direction. Um, so it's, it's really taking something that's collapsed and just blowing air into it uh, to inflate it. And so then you you end up with this uh, this point and uh, edge grid, the yellow and green grid on the right. That's kind of the inflation of the thing on the left. And then we can do loop subdivision on these triangles. And so you know we can continually refine this structure and we still have kind of a each triangle mapping to another triangle. So that, that's another kind of neat thing with this medial linkage is that, you know, if you talk about points, you have single medial linkage, double, triple, but when you look at triangles, triangles are always linked to one other triangle. So um, it, it makes it a little bit easier to work with this if you think in terms of triangles. So in practice, really what, what a, um what one of these models is, is is it's a it's a model uh with an even number of triangles where every triangle is matched up to another triangle on the other side of the model on the other side of the medial axis and once this model is created then we deform it to new objects with a set of constraints that quote unquote preserve medial linkage. So as I said, the boundary of the deformable template is going to be represented as a triangular mesh. Um, pairs of vertices are um, 
labeled as medially linked, and then every triangle is going to be linked to exactly one other triangle. And then these linkage constraints are enforced at the vertices during template deformation. There's one um, other thing um, that in the continuous case, you don't really need to worry about. So the free edges where the sphere is on or the, the ball is only um, linked to itself, um, there are really no, you don't need to have to impose any equality constraints for those points in the continuous case because they're just sort of the limit case of um, the regular points that are linked to one other point. But once you discretize, you have these edge points and you know they're just there without any constraints and you know they would be free to do whatever they want so um what we do instead is that we impose another constraint on them um that we know from medial geometry that the radius um of the inscribed disk there has to match uh one of the pr principal radii of curvature and so from the boundary discretization we can estimate uh cur principal curvatures and so then we can impose a constraint that r at that point has to match the principal curvature i'll just point out to the class that this is the the crest re uh, uh matching requirement that i talked i've i've talked about in uh, with s reps mm -hmm. um then we also have some additional inequality constraints for mesh quality, which is to say we don't want uh, long skinny triangles. Um, if we do, then any any geometric property we approximate from the triangular mesh is going to be problematic. And then um, in this approach, um, one of its downsides is that when we fit it to a target shape, we actually use um, distance to surface to surface objective functions rather than overlap objective functions and um i'll explain why i think on the next slide and then regularization just uh basically we want the surface to be deforming smoothly so how do we actually formulate the optimization here um so we have in this discretization, the unknowns are going to be the coordinates of these uh, points. Then for every pair of points that are medially linked, we also have the unknown R value, the radius function. Um, those are really the, the, the unknown values. And then we have a set of constraints for every pair of uh, medially linked points. There's a Equality constraint also for every pair of medially linked points. All the other points have to be outside of the um, imagined inscribed sphere. So that's a bunch of inequality constraints, plus some other inequality constraints having to do with mesh quality. So lots and lots of constraints. So in this particular um, first approach that we did, what we try to do is to make all of these constraints quadratic. Um, in other words, we try to formulate the problem as a minimization over some set of unknown variables um, so that the objective function is this quadratic form involving these unknown variables. And there's a set of constraints, equality or inequality constraints, that are also quadratic um not it's not necessarily required for this to be quadratic programming in order to solve these problems uh so the actual solver that we use um ip opt is an interior interior point optimization method it can handle um problems that are of higher order um or you know they don't even have to be polynomial but um just in practice found when, when everything is quadratic it seems to converge faster and behave better. Um, so to make things, to make everything quadratic, what we had to do is just introduce uh, lots and lots and lots of new uh, optimization variables. So just to give you an example, um, you know, we, we need to model the normal vector. 
So typically the normal vector to the boundary would be a computer is a cross product of two tangent vectors divided by its uh, norm. And, um, you know, that's nonlinear already. That's a division by square root. But what we can do is introduce a new variable that we optimize over, call it n, and then say, okay, here's a constraint. The n dotted with itself has to be equal to one. And then n dotted with a tangent vector has to be equal to zero. And so, you know, we just add new, more variables, but everything stays quadratic. So here's, you know, an example of a model that you see here, um, a first a coarse mesh and then a fine mesh fitted to a target shape and just showing you the number of vertices, the number of triangles on these uh, boundary meshes, and then much larger number of optimization variables, number of equality and inequality constraints. Um, and then, you know, the time it takes for the model to converge. It's a little slow. I mean, you see, this is not a lot, not a lot of triangles here, but it still takes like 300 seconds. Um, so that's, it's, it, it's limited in its speed quite a bit as well. But this is the first time um, that um, we really were able to start fitting objects with branching configurations. So here's this toy example that I showed before. Here's a model uh, that we started with, and here's this model fitted to the target shape. And here's the corresponding medial axis. And so you can see, you know, we're able to fit now uh, structures with these fin like branches, no problem. Um, there's also potential. We've never actually done it, but there's nothing to prevent you from uh, making this model work with tubular objects or part sheet, part tube objects. It's just that your medial linkage would have to be um, modified so that you can have endpoints linking to the same center of a medial inscribed uh, same inscribed ball center so you can mo model things that are part of it as a sheet part of it as a tube but that would be a neat project if somebody wanted to play with this um to actually make it work here's an example um of this actually in in a real model this is a aortic root apparatus so uh, sorry aortic valve apparatus so it's a a uh, model where you have uh, part of the aorta, but you have this tricuspid uh, valve in it as well. And so that's handled with medial branching. And you can actually see it fitting in, in real time. I mean, not in real time, but you see it fitting <laughs> to the target shape. Um, so I know I don't have a ton of time, but I will just quickly go through a couple more um, images from applications. So this is some some images from um, Allison uh, in my paper in 2015 that first used these models for describing the aortic valve apparatus. Um, it included uh, multi-atlas segmentation followed by modeling with this um, boundary constraint CMREP. Um, Allison has used similar models also for looking at um, a, a bicuspid aortic valve, which uh, uh, a smaller number of individuals have. So some people will only have two leaflets and it's a uh, understudied condition. It frequently requires surgery during um, patients' lives. And, and so she's been doing a lot of research on modeling uh you know different different uh, geometries and understanding how they relate to uh outcomes um, of surgery and um so what we've built on this was in in 2019 we it was still a boundary constraint model but we actually tried to integrate it more closely with diffeomorphic flows I didn't really, I didn't want to go into that work because um, I think the main idea is still uh, this boundary constraints. Um, it's just done in a slightly different setting with a different way of um, dealing with the constraints as well. It uses the uh, augmented Lagrangian method. Um, 
another so you, you asked about 4d so allison has done work uh, on uh, fitting models uh when you have multiple time points uh, uh in your target image and um imposing temporal constraints so using she, she's a Kalman filter um as a way to uh, impose time constraints on the uh, on the parameters of deforming models and um I think I'll stop for questions the remaining slides I had were um some other work that's not really uh medial representations just some uh <coughs> some concepts involving skeletonization and um you know sheet like structures but i, I want to make sure i have time to answer questions in the nine minutes we have left well, let me uh, ask for questions from the class i i'm i'm going to have an interesting discussion question after the class i mean once the class questions are are dealt with but let's give them priority so anybody from the class want to ask questions? <clears throat> well, while you're taking a question, I can just maybe quickly show a couple more models. So this is, again, this hard model that I was showing you before, this is one of these BCM reps, I actually, something that fitted this morning. Um, I'll show you one other one is really neat. So this is this is the model. Um, um, this is the uterus. And um, so you see the target structure, you know, it has an interesting topology. So you have the fallopian tubes here. Um, and uh, so, so there's a, you know, there's three holes in this object, and this is what the medial axis looks like. It has larger holes, and this is the boundary again. Um, show it again. So, so you know, there's a lot of flexibility in this uh, boundary-based model in in fitting complex shapes. Here, the medial axis is just a single sheet, but it's actually a single sheet with holes, so non non uh, planar topology. So I thought that was kind of neat. <clears throat> okay, so first of all, let me compliment you on your work. Uh, is uh, basically this I idea of a uh, you know, a discrete scaffold uh, for a continuous uh, <clears throat> surface that um, <clears throat> satisfies explicit medial constraints uh, and and it carried by differential equations uh, <clears throat> in into the computation of the relationships between the medial and and boundary models <clears throat> um, and. I mean, you've shown lovely apl applications of that idea. And, uh, the reason I, I've i admired it all along and, and the reason I invited you was because of that strength. <clears throat> Yet, um, I want to contrast that. Oh, okay, so the ph philosophical underpinning of the approach you take is that things are explicitly medial but you use optimizations to make it so that the explicit medial uh medially represented entity uh that satisfies medial properties approximately fits the target boundary that you're trying to get so <clears throat> it as an as an optimization method, it it it, ha, it has a level of approximation against the target boundary. So far, so so far, you agree? Yes. Okay. Um, so the alternative that we developed at at UNC um, uh, 
uh, allows a, a level of freedom uh, away from the explicit medial constraints. <clears throat> that is to say, this general skeletal model mm -hmm. has penalties of being too far from medial, but they but it doesn't require specific the specific medial requirements that your that your method does. Uh, and with that freedom, you can strangle yourself, maybe. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, it has the possibility of either of matching the the target boundary more closely mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or alternatively of matching it less closely with a a, a, a much uh with with few fewer triangles if you will with with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh and so okay so there is this uh possibility that um well this quite this research question that that we've never faced because we've both been too busy uh about what are the advantages or, or disadvantages of uh you know tying yourself specifically to the medial constraints or alternatively of having this freedom that may get you into trouble you want to comment on that yeah i mean i certainly um think that there are many situations where uh, having that additional freedom it, it would be very valuable. Um, so, I mean, even like the example I was showing here, uh, the the heart one, uh, I can load it while I'm talking. Um, so even in this example, there's uh, places, if you look closely, there's like a papillary muscle here. Um, you see this red bump? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's trying to go into the bump, but it can't go too far because of the medial constraint. Um, you know, so, um, you know, at some level, it's a question of, you know, do you want those bumps? Do you not want those bumps? Um, you know, the bump itself can be extraneous, but I think having the freedom to say how much you want to let the model go into the bumps versus not is, 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 is very valuable, and especially I mean, this is, um, you, you know, for me, uh, as much as I work on like the hippocampal region and cortex, um, the folding there is so, so steep that, um, you know, these, these uh, blonde medial constraints are just not able to really represent the fold, even though we know that cortex is sheet like, but it's not. <laughs> It bunches up in such a weird way in these tight uh, cell side that it, you know, this kind of model has, struggles with it. Um, yes, I think um, I think there there is some advantage to to the blumness as well, which is, for example, when, you know, it, it's clear what you mean by thickness when you use a model like this because there is an inscribed uh, sphere, and so we the radius of that sphere or the diameter of that sphere is thickness, but you know, I think when you um, have two spokes of different lengths, then it, it's a little bit less clear. You know how how to define thickness, but I'm sure I'm sure it it, it can still be done in a reliable way. Um, and as you said, you know there there is I guess some risk of having more than one possible configuration fitting the same model, the, the same target shape because of the additional freedom. Um, I think there's also a lot of opportunity to just kind of merge things, which is another thing, you know, if the students are interested in. So I think maybe some of the branching stuff um, that we've been able to, to handle with this boundary constraint approach, could that be merged with an um, SREP idea? I, I think it's very possible. Uh, it would be really cool to see that because, uh, it's, you know, I think I, I, there there is value to, mo to modeling branching if you know a priori what the branching is. You know, there's certainly uh, a, at least one dissertation in in how to ha handle branching in in the, in an SREP style, and you've 
pioneered that that direction in a very nice in a very nice fashion. Mm -hmm. um, um, okay, well, I want to thank you uh, on behalf of the whole class for for your contribution to this course. Uh, as you know, this uh, will uh, the recordings will will live on, and other people will hopefully benefit from uh, f from it over time. Uh, thanks again uh, <clears throat> for a very interesting and well done set of lectures. To the class, let me remind you that we will uh, reconvene in our normal uh, situation on Thursday with those who need to be at Zoom, uh, attending via Zoom, but the pre preferred attendance mean uh, means being in class where we can have uh, better interactions. Okay, till then, bye-bye.